Uh, good afternoon. My name is Charlotte Reed. I'm correspondent for France for CNBC. So as the MC just mentioned, we constantly hear about bottlenecks in the supply chain from car makers shutting down their factories because they don't have the pieces they need or storing cars on all airfields because they can't ship them. Uh, just last week, you heard from aerospace giant Airbus saying they could not deliver the number of planes they wanted to deliver this year because they don't have the pieces for, for that plane. So we hear this story constantly at the moment and companies and countries are rethinking the supply chains, uh, including reshoring. So the opposite of offshoring, but bringing back the supply chain closer uh, to deal with these sort of issues. And we know that ships carry over 80% of the goods traded globally. And of course, the reopening of the economies after the pandemic, there was a surge in demand and there was a real struggle to deal with it. And on top of that, of course, the war in Ukraine has added a headache to the supply chain. And of course, in this complicated economy, Creation ports are a crucial element, and I uh, have here the perfect guest to discuss all this. Martin Amblot, President and CEO of the Montreal Port Authority since January uh, 2021. Uh, it is an autonomous self-financing federal agency. So you have close to 25 years of experience in the public sector and also in energy companies, which will be very relevant here uh, as well. So your port is very specific because you're 1,600 kilometers inland uh, on the Saint Laurent River. Uh, you're a cruise and container port and you service Toronto, Central Canada and also of course the US Midwest and the Northeast. So first of all, from what I understand from your business, it's all about the three Ds. So it's decongestioning, decarbonizing and digitalize your business. So first of all, after this picture I've painted of difficulties on the supply chain, is it getting any better compared to the pictures we saw last year with all those boats that were waiting to get into pause, but had to wait for days, sometimes weeks. It's always fun to have an introduction where you say you're part of the problem. I came from an industry that was part of the solution, but we've had a very, very difficult two to three last years. And you've mentioned a few of the points, but uh, it was not one crisis that we had, but really four different crises. Of course, COVID changed everything. Um, and then demand was back, but China was down. And then everything was back but everything was congested. I was in LA in Long Beach uh, last year and we had literally dozens of ships waiting at anchor for days and weeks. And of course, we have the war in Ukraine now that has affected uh, some, some some route, especially on the, the grain and cereals side. And this has contributed uh, to, to the inflation. Reality is that there's civil lining and everything. First is that we're almost back to normal today. Do we have all the answers? No. We're back to normal for various reasons. One of them is the economic slowdown. So we're doing better because there's less demand. Of course, things have improved, but we're doing better because of this. Second thing, um, there's silver lining, as I said, in everything. Two years ago, in all of your shops, supply chain was not a hot topic. Today, if you talk to any citizen, any corporation, everyone has become a supply chain expert. So we do have the right context to rethink those supply chains to be much more efficient because there will be other crises. But we're doing okay now in eastern part of the continent, in North America and in Montreal. So it's, it's good news, it's almost it's back to normal, but it's bad news because it means there's less demand for manufacturing goods, etc. So what's your outlook for, for next year? How do you see the macro environment? Of course, it's impacting your business so much. Well, ports are our public service. We're there to support the communities. We're not a private private business, but we are really a leading indicator. Um, what we've seen over the last years is that Europe has suffered from 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 some economic downward uh, volumes. So for the last six months, uh, the U.S. a bit less for last quarter, and now it's 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 it's. it's Canada is being affected. Uh, Canada is a bit of a different economy, so it's a, I would say, much more resilient. It's less uh, diversified, but much, much more resilient. And uh, so we're seeing the volumes be dropping a bit. Uh, we, when if we talk with all the liners uh, and the shipping lines and the uh, the freight forwarders, everyone is expecting a certain downturn in 23. But that's not that's not too bad. We're not suffering that much, so we expect it to be to be back. But it is the perfect time to rethink, as I said, the supply chain, to think about digitalizing the solutions and to build infrastructure that are resilient for the next crisis to come. 
So let's dive into all this. And so what are the main lessons learned after specifically the, the pandemic? Have you managed to build some resilience into the system of that supply chain? I like to say that um, the, the two key lessons learned uh, is that we have seen the development of two new currencies. And bear with me, they're not Bitcoins. First currencies is that storage and reliability have become the name of the game. Storage is so important in a new world where it's not a just-in-time world anymore for critical goods, but it's a just-in-case. So we need to have dedicated storage, large facility in place, clo close to port facilities. Not all the ports have that. So the ports that are behaving the better are those who have very significant storage. And in my mind, what I see is very large facility uh, shared capacity, so uh, small to medium companies, not the large ones, but they can benefit from those costs. Otherwise, they will build their own storage and it won't be economical. So it, it will have an impact. Second thing, second currency, is that cost is one thing, but reliability and predictability have become key feature for reliable supply chains. So we're fairly fortunate because uh, in our part of the world, we're, we're, as you said, it's a bit different, very reliable, but uh, we really need to think from point A to production to point Z to ultimate consumption and ensuring that the overall chain is re reliable. It's really a world where it's still very fragmented. What about reshoring? Because that was one of the things that happened during the pandemic. Countries suddenly realized they didn't have the, the way to access their own masks or their own medicine. Um, they have uh, companies rethinking their whole supply chain. So how is that transforming your own business? Uh, and is there capacity for this kind of reshoring that we see from different countries, including North America, trying to cut down its dependence from China, for example? So how is that transforming the whole supply chain system? Uh, it is affecting a bit the the, the supply chains and the and the, the commercial trends, but if you look at it more deeply, uh, it's not a fundamental change yet. On the critical good, critical uh, let's say like minerals, we're really seeing a shift from from Asia to North America. Canada, for example, wants to be much more independent in um, uh, importing, transforming, and producing uh, key minerals like for for, for batteries for for cars and everything. Um, same thing for the medical equipment and medicine industry. We're seeing that trend. Um, but we're not expecting like a very fundamental shift from, uh, one region to the other. I think what we're seeing in my perspective is something similar to what we have seen after 89, after the Berlin Wall fell. It's a repositioning of key players and establishing new business consortium and in partnership. But Asia, for our part of the world will remain a very significant player, but contrary to what people would think, it's not China numbers that are growing in our economy. It's in Asia, it's Vietnam, and it's India. Um, Canada has a new Indie Pacific policy. Uh, it's interesting because uh, because of the crisis, everyone realized that, that ports are critical infrastructure and we need to build them ahead of time because if we build those facilities, after the crisis, we will all fail. I will have failed my job. Another lesson, I guess, from the pandemic, also mainly the war in Ukraine, is the question of independence and so sovereignty. Um, there was this big controversy recently when Germany uh, agreed to sell part of its port in Hamburg uh, to China. Um, do you think that the kind of infrastructure like ports, of course, you are you are a federal agency, but uh, are part of this kind of um, industry that should be ring fence because so strategic for the world economy and for country sovereignty. Well, that's a loaded one. Um, I don't want to speak on behalf of other ports, but um, as an essential service, as a public service, we need to think about infrastructures for decades to come and not to jump on the new sexy alternative we really need to be strategic not to fall in the same the same trap of of the past um but canada is the only g7 country that has free trade agreements with all g7 members and 98 percent of the trades with the g7 countries except the us they go and come through a port 
So it is strategic. We need to be cognizant of that of that reality, and we need to to make the good strategic uh, decision. How do digitalization and AI uh, help you streamline operations? So cut out some papers and all that. I mean, how do you use this kind of technology and and um, uh, adapt it uh, to your business? I'll brag a bit. It's not my habit, but I'll brag a bit. Three things that we've developed. Um, first, we have a uh, predictive tool at the portal. So trucks, when they come and get a container, they can go under app and go on their iPhone and they will know the exact waiting time for the day ahead. So we've streamlined that process and the waiting time for truckers have gone down significantly. It's very, it's, it's simple, but very efficient. Second thing. During pandemic, we've associated ourselves with the AI community. Montreal is known for its AI community with the Evado Lab uh, and uh, the Scale AI of this world. We have developed a tool again uh, for our customers that identifies very specific and critical goods that are in the container. Because you should know that ports don't always know what's are what's in the boxes. But now with the, the the AI application, it goes through the manifest and it can identify very critical good like medicines, mask, uh, nuclear uh, capacity for, for medical purposes and so on. And when it gets to the dock, it's identified and prioritized and expedited very efficiently. We've done that for uh, thousands and thousands of containers. The third one, is the dream of tomorrow. We can be efficient at a port, but it's really not sufficient. We really need to think it through the overall supply chain and try to identify and be predictive in what goes out from where and goes to, to who and where and when. This is not optimal today. And I'm sure that the overall chain can be, can be tracked. We have a, an application that is being developed today but um, we had a, a sad news a couple of days ago. Uh, Trade Lens, which was an initiative in that direction, was canceled. Basically, the whole industry has to work much more closely to ensure that the overall tracking capacity provides a predictive tool to customers. So, of course, digitalization in AI means um, less jobs. You need less actual people to. No, you don't. Well, that's interesting. Is you're not going. The port of the future is not just. Uh, organized by robots, you still need the manpower there. Well, the tendencies are the same. Uh, if you look at very sophisticated shops, uh, the automation and digitalization of the economy has not uh, provoked a job uh, cutting uh, significantly. It, it, it changes the jobs. It creates value. And if we want to attract the talent tomorrow in our industry, we need to be much more sophisticated. When Gen Z students are looking at the at the port uh, system and they're in school of course they see the boxes they see the containers but if they see how can we improve that supply chain and make it very sexy technical and appealing we'll be in much more position to attract talent tomorrow that's one of the questions i wanted to ask you about labor shortage because that's really a headache for a lot of people leading uh, companies so how do you deal with it how do you actually get the people on board to come and want want to work for you it's a challenge for everyone. Um, it's, it's, I, I joined the port two years ago. Um, I never thought about the supply chain before joining the port. So it's, it's, we, we're all the same. Governments concentrate on the production side of things because it's easy to regulate it. And consumers and citizens concentrate on the ultimate consumption aspect because that's what they see. The transportation and logistic piece in the middle don't attract a lot of attention. We need to go out there, we need to be public, we need to educate people about the importance of those three steps and the middle step as to do a much better job in attracting talent um, because uh, otherwise we'll have the same type of talent that we had yesterday and we need to diversify it and we need to have a new, new, younger and diversified talent. It's, it's a challenge. We're fortunate at the port uh, today, but I think some partners are, are suffering um, because young people don't know what logistics is all about. And it has the image of being a very male dominated kind of industry. Is it also an effort on your part to try to bring in women on board as well? Absolutely. I'm the anti diversity, uh, stereotype. Um, but the overall industry is not very diversified. Um, we, 
all businesses, all enterprises, all investors, we should always have a representation that is close to the representation of the society in general. Um, we heard the, the comments this morning. It's because you behave uh, more uh, normally, uh, you attract talent, you, you're more efficient, you're more innovative. Um, our business needs to do a lot more in attracting women talent, notably. Uh, it's, it's a challenge, but if, uh, by changing the image and educating, I think we'll attract a lot of those people. And there's a group of individual in Canada that, uh, that we haven't done a good job with is indigenous communities. Um, it's a significant portion of Canada's population, but the industry have never reached out to them. Um, we have communities at a few kilometers from the port of Montreal, uh, same thing with the port of Vancouver, and we need to attract talents in different communities. So those are two targets that uh, we will be dedicated in efforts uh, on in, in the future. Uh, let's talk about the big final challenge, of course, is decarbonization. There's a specific issue of carbon emissions for the shipping industry. There's aging fleets, et cetera, et cetera. But from your point of view, how are ports adapting to have the infrastructure for those fleets of the future? And what's the time scale also that you are looking at? One of the main reasons why I joined the port community is is to participate in the decarbonization of the of the supply chain. I was on the the, the offering of the solution. Now I'm on the bad consuming side. Um, we believe in the one two three punch to decarbonize the logistic uh, in the supply chain. We all have an infrastructure dilemma. We all are suffering from: Do we build it before and it's not uh, profitable? Or we wait to someone else to do it, which is what basically everyone is doing. But we believe in the one, two, three punch. First, we need to implement much more shore power. Whenever your ships are at dock, they should be consuming green electricity instead of burning diesel. It's progressing. We have a few dozens of those connections in, in Montreal and it's happening everywhere. In Canada and in Quebec, we have a very unique feature is that 100% of our electricity is green per nature. So if you connect your ship in using electricity, it, it's basically fully carbon neutral to start with. So that's the first bunch. The second one, we need to electrify directly or indirectly, notably via batteries, every single movement in a port community. There's no economic or, or technical sense today that we see a diesel generator at port. Uh, it doesn't make much sense for new investment. For circle uh, investment, that's one thing, but for new, it doesn't make sense. So we're doing that with, uh, and we're helping our, our operators. The second one is the most significant one, is helping the ships uh, having other fuels. And this is where I believe in a new stream of energy. Um, and of course, uh, my intuition comes from my past and having a green liquid that has the feature that is as close as possible to the diesel or the bunker is probably where it should be heading. So in my view, port authorities should have the mandate and should be more active in developing infrastructure of production and storage of green liquids, notably in Montreal, that could be producing hydrogen off-peak, storing it at site, and then transforming it to green methanol, which is fairly easy to use. We will do it, we will try it, and it won't be profitable. But we, Port Authorities, as public service, we need to have that mandate and we need to try it because the port, the, the shipping owners won't do it by themselves. We need to support them by putting in place infrastructure ahead of the market. Uh, final thoughts, we're closing 2022, but start 23. What's the key challenge that you're looking at for the new year for your business? Um, I, I think the, the, the global uncertainties right now are a concern to, to everyone. Uh, we, we, we think about Ukraine on a daily basis. We are increasing s uh, mineral, uh, cereals and grains export from Montreal to support Ukraine communities, notably. Um, that, that is changing, uh, a lot of, a lot of things. So going through the turbulence, um, but being resilient and looking at the very long, term and ensuring that we make and that let's say in a period where typically you don't 
do or make bold decisions because it's a downward pressure on the economy, it's the right time to think about the future decades and put in place solution for our partners. But every single customers and a citizen depend on port ability and reliability. So we're there for, for everyone. Very, very final question. Of course, one of the uh, situations is the reopening of China and China moving away from its uh, COVID zero policy. Of course, that means a lot of people have COVID at the moment. How concerned are you about the potential impact of this potential next few weeks, if not months, of the situation in China of, on the global supply chain again? Um, not all that much because I think, uh, we've learned a bit, uh, and it was so much worse early 21 when it was really shut down. Um, I'm not expecting honestly a big, a big, a big shift, um, because, uh, well, economic down turn in Europe and North America and China, um, uh, going through that phase. Um, I don't think that's going to be the, the major impact. I think really, uh, Europe and America, uh, economic situation will drive much more, uh, the future in 23, but, uh, it looks promising. On positive notes, then thank you so much. Martin Blot, president and CEO of the Montreal Port Authority. Thank you. Merci.